Theoretical physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer led the team of scientists who developed the atomic bomb that was used to end the Second World War. Whatever your views on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there is no doubting the key role Oppenheimer played in bringing the Manhattan Project together and making sure it achieved its goal. But Oppenheimer was a complex man, full of contradictions. A brilliant scientist who was once so overwhelmed by emotion he tried to strangle a friend and poison his college tutor. Welcome to Insane History. I'm Professor Graham Yorston, neuropsychiatrist, and today I'm exploring the extraordinary life of Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atom bomb. The new Christopher Nolan movie I'm sure will do a great job at conveying all the urgency and intensity of the Manhattan Project, but I want to focus on Oppenheimer's early years to understand the man behind the headlines. The man who was faced with perhaps the most complex moral dilemma that anyone has ever had to consider. The man who for a time held the future of humanity in his hands. Julius Robert Oppenheimer was born in New York in 1904. His father was a German Jewish immigrant who arrived in the country penniless and made a fortune as a textile importer. His mother was a painter and he grew up in a swanky New York apartment with Picassos and Van Goghs on the wall. And I'm not talking IKEA prints here, these were originals. At school, he was precocious and streets ahead of his classmates. At nine, he said to a cousin, ask me a question in Latin and I shall answer you in Greek. This didn't make him particularly popular, but he didn't mind. He was more interested in his rock collection. He became so knowledgeable on the subject, he corresponded with geologists and was invited to speak at the age of 12 to the prestigious New York Mineralogical Club. He described himself as an unctuous, repulsively good little boy. He skipped several grades at school, read the classics, in the original language of course, and the greats of 19th century literature. At the age of 14, hoping to embrace the outdoors, he went on a summer camp. And even though he was mercilessly bullied, he never complained or asked to come home. Although he was most at home with a book, he also enjoyed sailing a passion his father indulged by buying him a 28-foot sloop, which he would take out even in stormy weather, oblivious of the danger. He decided to major in chemistry at Harvard, but before starting, he had to take a year out because of a bad case of dysentery caught on a geology trip. He recovered his strength on a friend's ranch in New Mexico and launched himself at Harvard with his customary gusto. He took six classes per term and moved on to advanced physics through independent study. He even threw in a few courses of Latin and Greek, studied Eastern philosophy and wrote poetry. He was noticeably different to most of the other students. He had a peculiar diet of chocolate, beer and artichokes. He never read a newspaper or showed any interest in politics or worldly affairs. He had a very restricted circle of friends and once said to his brother, also a physicist, I need physics more than friends. Another thing he showed no interest in throughout his time at Harvard was dating. He was certainly interested in women and even wrote a few raunchy poems, but he was too in love with ideas to fall in love with a person. He graduated after only three years, but what to do next? Never shy, he wrote to Nobel Prize winner Sir Ernest Rutherford head of the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University, at the time the leading nuclear research establishment in the world, asking if he could come and work there. He had a recommendation from his Harvard professor, extolling his virtues, but acknowledging his clumsiness in the lab, and suggesting he was most suited to a role in theoretical physics. Oppenheimer arrived in Cambridge in 1925 and immediately struggled with being away from home. Rutherford wasn't impressed, but he was given a bench in the basement laboratory and tasked with work he considered beneath him. The work required dexterity and patience and attention to detail, 
none of which he had. At times he would work himself up into such a state he would roll around on the floor in tears. He wrote to a friend, I am having a pretty bad time. The lab work is a terrible bore and I am so bad at it that it is impossible to feel that I am learning anything. In an effort to help him improve his practical laboratory skills, Oppenheimer was assigned a tutor, Patrick Blackett, just a few years older to mentor him. Blackett had served in the Royal Navy in the First World War. He was good looking, suave and self-assured. He was witty, friendly and had recently married a beautiful, vivacious and brilliant woman and together they were considered the handsomest and happiest couple in Cambridge. All this perfection stirred something up in Oppenheimer. He was painfully aware of his shortcomings and he wasn't used to feeling second best to anybody. So what did he do? He injected an apple with cyanide and left it on Blackett's desk. Yes, you heard correctly. The man responsible for developing mankind's most lethal weapon once resorted to the Snow White tactic of using a poisoned apple. Although Blackett never ate the apple and was unharmed, the university wanted to report the matter to the police as an attempted murder. But Oppenheimer's parents, who were fortunately over on a visit, persuaded the authorities to give him another chance. There was a condition, however, that he see a psychiatrist. He was diagnosed with dementia precox, the old name for schizophrenia, which emphasises its relentlessly progressive nature and the belief at the time that it would inevitably lead to permanent insanity and dementia. In the 1920s, there were no effective treatments and it was considered incurable. There is no evidence that Oppenheimer ever experienced hallucinations or paranoid delusions, the characteristic symptoms of schizophrenia. However, there was thought to be a subtype of schizophrenia called simple schizophrenia, defined as a reduction in external attachments and interests and by the impoverishment of human relationships without conspicuous delusions or hallucinations. It seems likely to me that his doctor may have been thinking of this, as otherwise it is hard to see how he could have made such a diagnosis. We don't know any details about what was discussed in his sessions, but it was the era when psychoanalysis was taking off, and Oppenheimer, with his usual enthusiasm, embarked on reading up on the topic, almost certainly in German. He remained depressed and confused with everything going on in his life, and another strange incident occurred. While on a train journey, a young couple were kissing and cuddling in the seat opposite. When the man got off, Oppenheimer dropped onto his knees in front of the woman and began kissing her. He then came to his senses and apologised. But when the woman got off the train, he followed her, and as she was walking under a footbridge, he tried to drop his suitcase on her head. Fortunately, it missed and no one was hurt. But a second potentially murderous act within a few weeks was a sign he was not right. During the Christmas break, he went to France and walking along a beach in Brittany, depressed and alone, he thought about ending his life. Trying to be positive, he went to Paris to meet up with an old school friend who could see he was not well. To lift his spirits, his friend told him that he was getting married, whereupon Oppenheimer leapt on top of him and tried to strangle him with a luggage strap. Although his friend easily pushed him off, it was clear to them both that Oppenheimer had some serious psychological troubles. His parents were also in Paris, and for some reason he decided to lock his mother in her hotel room. When she got out, she insisted he see a psychiatrist in France. The root of Oppenheimer's problem was immediately recognised as sexual frustration, and he was prescribed a woman. Whether he was able to fill his prescription, so to speak, we don't know, but he could hardly have been in a better place to do so. He was a very intense young man, tall, thin and constantly fidgeting. He chain-smoked to cover up his restless energy. He was shy and socially awkward and would often have periods of losing himself in deep thought, and at these times he would neglect to eat. 
He was not unaware of his problems and had a dark sense of humour, describing his daily routine at Cambridge as... I read Greek, commit faux pas, search my desk for letters, and wish I were dead. Voila. Back in Cambridge, he saw a third psychiatrist, but eventually gave up on him, as he decided he knew more about psychoanalysis through his reading than his doctor did. After a miserable year at Cambridge, he was invited by Max Born to study at the University of Göttingen in Germany, 200 miles from Berlin. There, he met some of the greatest minds in theoretical physics, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, and Enrico Fermi, amongst others. He developed a reputation for being loud and over-exuberant in seminars, to the extent that some of his fellow students presented Born with a petition, threatening to boycott them unless Oppenheimer was instructed to calm down. This enthusiasm was also evident in the oral examination for his doctorate, after which one of the examiners, Nobel Prize winner James Frank, said, I'm glad that's over. He was on the point of questioning me. He then returned to the US to do postdoctoral work at the California Institute of Technology, working with Linus Pauling, one of the few people to win two Nobel Prizes. But their collaboration ended when Oppenheimer made a misjudged clumsy pass at his wife. In 1928, he visited Paul Ehrenfest's institute at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, where he gave lectures in Dutch, an example of his extraordinary ability to pick up new languages. He also spent time with Wolfgang Pauli in Zurich, Switzerland, before returning to take up an associate professor post at the University of California at Berkeley. Opinions differ on his teaching skills. Some of his students found he had no idea at what level to pitch his lectures, assuming way too much knowledge. Even those who were more positive said they had to repeat his classes as they were so challenging. But his brilliance began to attract a following of devoted acolytes. For those in his inner circle he was supportive and he could do no wrong in their eyes. But others found him a show-off, arrogant, and unnecessarily blunt. At this time, the world of physics was buzzing with new ideas about quantum mechanics and relativity. What all this meant and could mean for the universe and humanity was still being worked out. Oppenheimer was at the center of all of this, working on everything from subatomic particles to black holes. This tendency to leap from topic to topic in his research frustrated Oppenheimer's colleagues. At times, he would even jump to subjects unrelated to physics. Reading Proust or learning Sanskrit, his mind worked so fast he would rush through calculations on his papers without taking the time to double check, and he developed a reputation for careless errors. In 1936, he met Jean Tatlock, a student at Stanford Medical School, and over the next four years, they came close to marrying. It was Jean who introduced him to the politics of social reform and got him involved in anti-fascist activities. It was this involvement that would get him into trouble later, in the post-war McCarthy era, when even the faintest tinge of red in someone's past was enough to get them deemed un-American. With the German invasion of Poland in September 1939, Europe was plunged into war. Albert Einstein, then working in Princeton, and others wrote to President Roosevelt warning of the danger to the world should the Nazis be the first to make a nuclear bomb. It is this letter that launched the race to beat them to it, the race to harness the terrible power of a new weapon through the Manhattan Project. But back in Berkeley, Oppenheimer was oblivious to all this. He was getting married to Kitty Puning, also involved in left-wing politics, who had been married twice before and was now pregnant with his child. Their son was born in May 1941, and a daughter followed in 1944. But family life was complicated, as Kitty was quite a complex character in her own right. Oppenheimer continued to see Jean Tatlock, and he also started a relationship with psychologist Ruth Tolman, who was 11 years his senior and married to a friend and fellow Caltech physicist. Early work on developing a nuclear bomb went on at various sites in the US and independently in Britain, 
but Oppenheimer's role was initially a minor one. In 1943, the US Army wanted to set up a new laboratory to get the project to completion, and it needed a leader. The obvious candidates were doing essential work elsewhere, and General Leslie Groves was forced to consider Oppenheimer in spite of his somewhat suspect friends. In the end, he was persuaded that Oppenheimer was the man for the job, and he personally waived the security concerns. Oppenheimer suggested the plateau of Los Alamos near Santa Fe, New Mexico, as the location for the new lab. And under his leadership, the international team of scientists overcame all the obstacles and exploded the first nuclear device on the 16th of July, 1945. The war in Europe was over, the Germans having surrendered two months previously. But the war in Japan was not. Little Boy was dropped on Hiroshima on the 6th of August, and the more powerful Fat Man plutonium bomb was dropped on Nagasaki on the 9th of August. Japan surrendered on the 15th of August, and two days later, Oppenheimer travelled to Washington to hand deliver a letter to Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, expressing his concerns and his wish to see nuclear weapons banned. In October, he met President Harry S. Truman to hand in his resignation, saying he felt he had blood on his hands. The remark infuriated Truman, who ended the meeting and told his staff he didn't want to see that son of a bitch crybaby scientist in his office ever again. Oppenheimer returned to Princeton to become head of the Institute for Advanced Study and he was appointed chairman of the General Advisory Committee of the US government's Atomic Energy Commission. However, when the development of the much more powerful hydrogen bomb was being discussed in 1949, he openly expressed his opposition to the plans. This led to accusations of disloyalty, even that he was a Russian spy. A security hearing in 1954 ruled that although he was not guilty of treason, he should no longer have access to military secrets. This was at least in part due to the negative testimony of Edward Teller, his former subordinate at Los Alamos, who said, In a great number of cases, I have seen Dr. Oppenheimer act in a way which was for me exceedingly hard to understand. I thoroughly disagreed with him in numerous issues, and his actions frankly appeared to me confused and complicated. Oppenheimer lost his security clearance, and his role as a government advisor was over. But Teller was heavily criticised and shunned by the scientific community, whereas Oppenheimer received support from scientists around the world. He continued in his role at the Institute for Advanced Study, but published little research after the war. He was plagued by guilt over his role in the atom bomb project and the humiliation of losing his security clearance. He spent a lot of time away from the public eye on St John in the Virgin Islands, and retired in 1966, dying of throat cancer the following year. In 2014, the full declassified transcript of the 1954 security hearing was released, which reinforced the perception that Oppenheimer's career had been cut short by a mixture of professional jealousy and hysterical 1950s McCarthyism. There is no doubt that Oppenheimer was a brilliant scientist. He became an inspiring teacher, with many of his collaborators and students going on to win the Nobel Prize. Manhattan proved he was an able administrator. But what about his personality? Precocious, with a restricted range of interests. Overenthusiastic and difficult to stop when talking about his interests. Difficulties seeing things from the perspective of others. Rigid and perfectionist lacking in social awareness, with a tendency to make rude comments only to realise later with regret how rude they were. Poor awareness of danger. All of these can be seen in people on the autistic spectrum. And perhaps it will come as no surprise that a scientist who preferred physics to friends might be considered autistic. But we have to be careful in assessing information from published biographies. I've used this book, the highly respected 700-page American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer, 
but there are a dozen other biographies, all with their own tale to tell. All biographers have to decide which version of their subject story they are going to present, and select information that supports the premise of their book, and make it different from others. This selection bias makes it difficult to draw conclusions about a person's mental health from published biographies. So although I would say that there is much to suggest that Oppenheimer may have been autistic, we lack information on his developmental history and don't know whether he had any of the other features of autism, so a firm diagnosis cannot be made or excluded. There is also an increasingly vocal lobby that would say it is wrong to think of autism as a diagnosis anyway as it is not a mental disorder at all, but simply a variation of normality, an aspect of natural human diversity. I think that debate is too big to get into here, but what we can say is that for all Robert Oppenheimer's brilliance as a scientist, he clearly had major difficulties coping with his emotional state at Cambridge, and this led him to attacking at least two people. As a practicing psychiatrist, I often see young people struggling with the transition to life at university. They feel alone, inadequate, and that things will never get better. And I do my best to convince them that they can get through the difficult times. But sadly, not everyone wins these battles. I hope that by highlighting the very real turmoil that Robert Oppenheimer, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, went through as a young man, will show people with their own struggles that they are not alone and that they can get through and go on to achieve amazing things. I will leave the last words to Oppenheimer himself, who once wrote to an old teacher who supported him at a difficult time. What has soothed me most, I think, is that you perceived in my distress a certain similarity to that from which you had suffered. It had never occurred to me that the situation of anyone who now appeared to me in all respects so impeccable and so enviable, could be in any way comparable with my own. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon for more Insane History.